I think we are good to go. Good morning. Welcome to Echo Voices. My name is Deb Fitzgibbons, and it is a pleasure to welcome you today on a chilly day in February. We are, uh, if you have signed in, of course, this is your record for attendance, and we do issue uh, certificates of attendance. You should receive those automatically. Uh, the handouts for today, I did post a direct link into the chat box, uh, but the handouts for this session and all sessions and recordings of previous sessions uh, can be found at this more link right here. As uh, I said, you will be getting uh, credits for this. We now are including um, comprehension quizzes with our recordings so that you can take a quiz and be issued a certificate if you pass with at least a 90%. So we're really trying to find ways for you to get uh, credits uh, that you need, even if you're in your jammies. So there you go. I mentioned the Zoom closed captioning, and it is uh, one of the surest and uh, uh, best uh, first things you can do for universal design, turning this on. It's not just for hearing impaired. It's for so many different uh, reasons. Those who um, uh, are looking for confirmation, uh, you know, comprehension, uh, that th having those uh, words appear on the screen help us focus. Uh, so many different reasons. So you're able to click and change what that uh, transcript looks like for you to make it larger or smaller. But if you're ever in question, should I turn on closed captioning? The answer is yes. Turn it on. Echo Voices. This is uh, the second half of our second year. And we are proud to be partnering with, yay, it's a two and a half, it's a year and a half anniversary. Uh, let's celebrate that we are in partnership with uh, the Oregon Department of Education to be, bring professional development. Uh, this Echo Voices, of course, is all about working with learners with complex communication needs. Uh, we are part of OTAP, um, and we have been housed here in the Douglas ESD in beautiful downtown Roseburg uh, for more than 30 years. And uh, we are pleased to carry on this tradition now virtually allows us to bring equitable professional development, no matter what side of the mountain you're on. And it's only professional development if we learn and grow. And that happens through uh, your inclusion. Your voices need to be heard here too. So please feel free as we go along to unmute yourself or type in the chat box. I'm going to ask our guest today, Kelly Fawner, whether she prefers to have questions at the end or, or, um, have, or throughout when people have questions. Kelly, what is your preference there? We'll do questions throughout. There are some natural breaks in the content, but if something seems immediate to you, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. All right, we love, we love Kelly. She's, she's fielding questions as she's go, she goes. So my name is Deb. Again, I'm the coordinator of OTAP, the Oregon Technology Access Program. And the other hat I wear is of course, regional and statewide services uh, for students with orthopedic impairment. So we support uh, therapists and uh, AT folks, and there are so many things that we all have in common. Uh, I'm pleased uh, for the last 30 some years, Gail Bowser has been in involved with both of these grants. And uh, here we have uh, the voice of the past, the present and the future. We have lots of things going on right now. Gail, uh, please unmute yourself and say hey to the folks today. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with you again, and I'm very pleased to have uh, Kelly Foner with us today. She's also an old friend. Um, I have lots of disclosures. I do a lot of independent contracting, but these are the three uh, ECHO projects that I work directly with on a regular basis. Um, so I thought I'd let you know that there's also uh, an echo ties for um, therapists in educational settings. And I work with the University of Wyoming on an echo and assistive technology project. And echo is one of those, another one of those things that is expanding. And there are, are lots of networks in all kinds of different uh, areas. And I just wanted to make note that yesterday or, or over the weekend, I got a message from uh, Susan Cahill, who's from the um, um, Occupational Therapy Association, and she wanted to know, could she have someone in their association 
um, join us on our next Echo Ties because at AOTA, they are really looking at uh, the ECHO model uh, for delivery of professional development. So it is a great model. We are glad to bring it and it is growing. So um, we are pleased to bring it to you. ECHO Voices now again for the second year. You know, Deb, um, since you mentioned that, we're also the, the, main, the big ECHO network um, is beginning a research project on uh, the eth efficacy of doing echo sessions. So we'll have some data to report probably not till next fall, but um, we wanna know how much difference this makes. So um, stay tuned for that. You'll probably get an invitation to let us to answer some questions for that. Great things going on. Started as a medical model and now really uh, in education, it's embedded in a lot of what we're doing. And, and uh, so thank you for that, Gail. I um, wanted to also say that next Monday, uh, the 22nd, another announcement will be going out, but we are having our monthly statewide town hall meetings for therapists. They are bringing together your questions and your voices uh, and bringing them back to those who are with our licensing boards uh, and our national associations and our Medicaid folks. And, and the questions that you are bringing are being heard and making change. And, at the Medicaid uh, and uh, the health authority level. Uh, they're going to be presenting to us next week about how they have been listening and how they have created somewhat of a listserv or a, a communication because they were listening to us. We wondered how we were going to let everybody know about the great work that was happening because of your voices. And they came in and said, here's how we're going to, here's one of the ways that we're going to do it. So they've created something that is a source of information that is all coming back because of your voices. Uh, I often have been said, saying lately that uh, the further from the boardroom you get, the less sense those decisions might make. And you are coming back and saying, this doesn't make sense. And they are coming back and saying, does this make sense? And they are listening. So it's really exciting to be part of that. And we welcome you. Uh, we do record these so you can listen to them, but it is, you are being heard. Thank you for that. We are putting uh, putting together our annual conference, AT Ties Together. Uh, we will be opening registration uh, within, the next, uh, uh, within the next week. Um, we have an amazing lineup. Um, we are um, opening it and adding to it as we go along. It, uh, we are putting together contracts and agreements. And I think that the environment that we're in right now where we can bring an expert on a topic and not have to pay them to come all the way here. And, uh, it all, it, and we also have a travel budget that we haven't used this year. So being able to uh, combine all of those things, I'm just so excited to be able to launch for you uh, an amazing event. So watch for that. Uh, mark your calendar for the 3rd of March. Our next uh, Echo Voices will be Deanna Wagner, who is sharing stories of ourselves, engaging and building on um, AAC skills. So uh, we look forward to March 3rd. Mark that down. We will send you a reminder. Today, couldn't be happier to welcome Kelly back. Kelly talked to us about working with families and and some myth busters in that area before. And, and Kelly just has so uh, a wealth of knowledge. Um, she, I should let Gail and introduce her because as like she said, she's been a longtime friend and colleague uh, in the world of quiet. Maybe you've heard of quality indicators for assistive technology. If not, let's talk. <laughs> I'm so pleased to bring to you uh, Kelly Fauna. She's now an educational assistive technology consultant. And I first met Kelly um, in the early 2000s, whenever I was going through the assistive technology uh, certificate through CSUN. Um, and, I, and part of it was online. And then we all got together for a week in Chicago. So I met Kelly Fauna in Chicago uh, a number of years ago now, and it is uh, such a pleasure that our paths keep uh, keep intersecting. Kelly, I'm going to be quiet now and let you share with us today your screen and your story and low-tech Ogcom systems. Well, thanks for having me. I'm going to switch over to my screen here. 
Um, if you've been able to uh, download the handout, you see that there's lots of information there, which is pretty typical in one of my sessions. I don't always expect to be able to get to it. And in this particular session, I'm going to spend about half the time um, giving information. And then the other half the time, we're going to switch over to my document camera. And I'm going to have you pin that document camera when we get to the point so I can start showing you um, the different systems. So I'll kind of set it up and then we'll switch over um, with this pile of examples that'll probably be falling off my desk before soon. So as Deb said, my name's Kelly Fonner. I do training and consulting. My background is as a special education teacher and I'm currently a special ed teacher. I have a couple kids virtually online um, that I'm doing literacy instruction and other things with them. And then, but for the majority of time I spend consulting, doing training. My disclosures are I do contract training with different companies, none of whom are paying me to do this session. All right, so my, my contract is with uh, OTAP for, for these kinds of sessions. So that's how you can get a hold of me. Um, the other thing in my background is that I also had a sister-in-law um, who lived to be 72 years old. She had, and I have her communication board somewhere right here with me. Um, and Kay had cerebral palsy and used a lots of different assistive technologies, including low tech communication boards to clarify her speech to people. So I always have that um, by my side um, to use in, in presentations and, and sessions. So we're gonna take a look at low tech. Um, and low tech can be you know, associated with dedicated devices like GoTalks and Quick Talkers, things that have the you know, Big Macs, things that have batteries in them, but also low tech communication systems can be robust. You know, they can be communication boards. They can be multi-level communication boards. So we're gonna take a look at the features of those and then just give you a slew of examples. One of the silver linings of our time with COVID is that many of the AAC manufacturers have been making available free core language boards. And so some of the examples I'll be showing you are things that I've gotten right off of companies' websites like uh, SmartFox Technologies at, with their super core boards and, you, and using the copies from Proloquo to go And we have people that will customize those as well as having them with electronic systems. So sometimes a low-tech system isn't a child's sole system it's combined with a high-tech app or device, or it may be part of the building blocks. You'll see some of the examples that I show you are ones that build like from Project Core, where we might start with four symbols and move to nine to 12 to 36, so that we're building language as students build their access to different types of tools. When we look at who are these students or who are these people that might use low tech AAC, it could be those people that need an, a, to, a total alternative to communication. They have little or no speech. They may struggle with language comprehension issues and having a big box of talking words or a board with talking with words that they point to that people read from help them express themselves more easily. We always wanna be in this situation where our augmentative communicators can communicate to anyone at any time about anything that they want to. And sometimes that leads to low tech. Um, there is this whole expressive struggling language group that we use AAC systems with. Sometimes they have a speech motor disorder but sometimes it's more in the area of language and it might be that that's below their chronological level and using some of these low tech supports um, in different activities or helping to pull together more than one word sentences and utterances can be really helpful. And the third group here is that supportive group. We have some of our students that are partially intelligible 
or kids that are just developing their speech, it may be delayed, and using low tech systems as a way to support them on their path. Um, and I'll see even, as I mentioned, some of my kids who have high tech AAC systems also have low tech representations that people have printed out um, so that if they have issues of batteries not being charged, or maybe you have an AAC system that's dependent upon the internet and your internet's down, that you've got this backup. There are lots of different types of AAC systems and I'm not gonna run through this whole list because we're gonna concentrate on the low tech systems. So taking a look at kind of the low tech AAC systems, how they're delivered through object boards and scanners and eye gaze frames and things like wristlets, um, and then the printed language boards. And then as I mentioned, we also have low tech systems that have batteries in them, multiple levels, those types of things. So just kind of put low tech in its perspective of the higher tech systems. When we talk about feature matching and looking at low tech systems, we look at the needs and abilities of consumers. You know, what kind of background do they have with language and AAC support? Sometimes I run into kids who have abandoned so many different types of systems that we're looking at low tech to just find a good language match for them before we start looking at the electronic downloadable apps or dedicated devices. Uh, so we just need to figure out why did these other systems that they tried not work? And a lot of times it's got to do with the language structure of the AAC system, that it wasn't a good match to the processing capabilities of students. So we're gonna take a look at those features and how different things are laid out. Um, you'll see some more information. One of the things I like, this is, um, adapted from Maureen Nevers and how she looks at high-tech AAC is that when you're looking at low-tech systems, we think basically in these three groups, what's the format gonna be? How are those symbols delivered? Are they on an eye gaze board? Are they on a printed board? Are they a low-tech you know, switch operated voice output device? or a voice, operated, a voice output device that has different levels or different numbers of symbols? Is it something that's more portable, like a ring of cards? And we wanna make sure that expressive card rings aren't confused with those kind of flip rings that we have for behavioral purposes. You know, I don't have kids talk with their behavior supports. They have a separate set of supports for their expressive communication. But you know, sometimes when we're out and about in the community, when we're out on the playground, when we're running around the kindergarten classroom, having being able to run around with the iPad is very difficult. But if I have something on my wrist, so if I have some quick communication messages on a wristlet, or I have them on a, a clip on onto my pants, you know, it makes it a little bit easier for me to be able to clarify what I'm talking about. And then we have low tech systems that are delivered through picture exchange. So thinking about what's the format, then what is the access? I mentioned picture exchange. Is it a symbol that's going to be exchanged? Is it a symbol that my student eye gazes to? Is it a symbol that's on a single switch? Is it a symbol that's delivered through partner assisted scanning for somebody who can't touch or use a switch? So what, what's the access method? You know, mo many of the boards are created to be accessed through direct selection, but we have to be prepared for those kids that don't have a direct point to the symbols that are on the screen. Sometimes we have great big displays on our walls that we can go over and you know, touch or pull a symbol off of. And then of course, the other component is the symbol and the language structure. 
Is it an object? And we've got a slide that kind of names out all of the different um, symbol sets. But thinking about using color to color code parts of speech, these things don't just happen in high tech systems. We prepare kids for high tech by doing this in their low tech system and having an organizational strategy to their low tech system. So just a couple slides here till we get into that meat of the processing piece of what does the access look like? I probably talked through most of this already. You know, how big are things? How many grids might be available? Um, do you need to have a stylus to help you touch? And we enlist the help from our OTs and our PTs to help kids be more accurate in their selection. So those kinds of things need to be thought through as you're preparing a low tech system or modifying one. And then the most obvious is what you get out of using it. Is it a low tech device that has some type of visual display? And one of the um, systems that's around very you know low tech with a display is a picture exchange book. And so if I have my picture exchange book, I'm going to have to leave this under the document camera. You know, I have my symbols, but my display when I get up to the level in picture exchange where I have my sentence strip, this is my visual presentation menu. So I have this way of putting my symbols on to my display and then I'm giving my sentence strip to my communication partner. So we think about, you know, a lot of people just think about that as being level five and six in picture exchange, but it also represents a feature that we've done things like added these onto some of the low tech devices where I'll Velcro a sentence strip onto a GoTalk or a Quick Talker or a Logan Talker so that I'm moving things to a strip and not just single messages kind of hanging out and about. So you see an example here on the middle picture of a um, picture exchange communication book with the sentence strip. Please notice that I'm not saying that it's a peck. A peck is not a thing. You know, a lot of times people will hold up a symbol and call it a peck. Peck is the process, the picture exchange communication process. And the symbols are different types of symbols, like PCS symbols, high contrast symbols, those things. Oh, one last thing, let me go back to output, is that some of the low tech systems have recorded voice. Some of the low tech systems have tactual feedback. So especially associated with switches, that when somebody operates the switch, they feel a vibration. And that can be an output that's needed by some of our students. And another output less used, but critical often to emergent communicators is being able to connect with toys and appliances and have a voice output message, make it go. And in the lower right hand corner on this slide is a Big Mac that an adapted minion uh, is attached to. So when this little boy presses it and it says, make it go, the minion dances around. And so you have that feature in some of the really low tech systems and it's called a toy jack or an appliance jack. So you can put that toy in, it will run it as a switch, but also have a vocal message for it. In the upper right hand corner, there's portion of a super talker device. And those devices have a toy jack in the back of them so that some of the squares can be associated with turning on a toy. So you'll see companies like Adaptivation, Attainment, and um, AbleNet have those features built into low tech systems. So don't ignore that. I, I When I was an early childhood teacher, we were always turning on toys and then adding the voice output to it made it so much more meaningful for kids. 
and engaging, how motivating that is. There uh, you go. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and we have to have a hook. We have to be able to reel them in so that they can learn. Uh, I know my friend Vicki Bernard had her hand up at one point. Oh, good. Let's hear, let's hear from Vicki. Yeah, she, when you were, I think it was when you were talking about pecs. And it could right. be, that resonated with her. Vicki, is that something you wanted to comment about? Um, not particularly. I just wanted to say thank you for saying that because I say that over and over and over to people that I'm working with. And, and I just keep hearing pecs, pecs, pecs. It's like, it's not pecs. <laughs> not doing pecs. We're doing picture communication. Good, yeah. And I think that people, you know, they... They get, you know, people who are novices in our field of AAC hear certain terms and then they get misused sometimes by the person that told them that. So it just gets perpetuated. But I'm like you, Vicki, I'm constantly saying, PEX is not a thing. <laughs> it's a process. Well, another but It is, it's a very, and it's a very systematic process. Yes. That, you know, it can't, I mean, it's, very systematic and you can't just do it right and one of the reasons that we started putting the sentence strip on low-tech devices was to make a transition from the picture exchange communication you know really low tech no tech book to something with voice output because too many people didn't look at those features and they would give kids a go talk and they wanted them to push and kids used to be handy. And so they tried to change the format as well as what a kid was doing to communicate. And then it wouldn't go so well. And then people would blame it on the kid and say the kid's not ready for voice output when really it was the adults that messed up the process. You know, we didn't transition students well. One of the reasons that people like these Logan talkers for kids who use picture exchange is that these little symbols um, are transferable onto a voice output device. Wherever they land on the device is what is said, you know, whatever is programmed in the chip. Um, I have another AAC organized strategy that's based upon picture exchange, but it's about core vocabulary. And Northern Speech Services, I don't, you know, I'm not getting anything from them, but they, and it's, it's a little bit unwieldy, but when you have the whole thing open, and I'm going to open it up when we're on, we've got the document camera, but it also is a nice transition from a requesting style picture exchange book into the world of more robust vocabulary. So we look at symbols, you know, a lot of people talk about symbols in relation to high tech systems, but you've got your building blocks for symbol use in low tech. So whether you need something that's got texture to it or something that somebody can grasp or something that's easier to see, there is not a hierarchy in symbols because sometimes like eye functioning, visual acuity, these kinds of things may lead visual perception, cortical vision impairment may lead us away from using things like photographs, that it may be more simpler to see things that are less involved. So things that might be black and white drawings or simply colored in images. So I know that some people think, oh, I'm supposed to start with objects and then move to photographs. That whole hierarchy was debunked in the 80s and it's something that still comes back to us. So we look at what is the highest level of something that represents a message for our students. So part of your trial process, and it's nice to do it with low tech, is to use different symbol systems to see what makes the most sense to your student. So you're going to see in these examples different um, symbol systems. And then we look at the structure. So how is this organized? You know, there's a big push for core boards, but it has to be core plus other things. You know, we used to have a lot of choice boards or a lot of activity boards, but then people started using those core vocabulary. And you have other, have other sessions here through Echoes um, 
on core vocabulary. So I don't need to go through that with you. But think about how was that arranged and how do you add fringe to it? And how do you add a child's custom and personal vocabulary? And then how are those messages stored? What's the little label? Is it a whole sentence? Is it a phrase? Is it a single word? And don't assume that if a child is not a sight word reader that they shouldn't have labels on their messages. Often the messages are there for the communication partner so that the communication partner can read that label. So I'm going to take a little pause and see if there's any other questions and then we're going to um, I'm going to roll through these and then go to the document camera to show you the things that are in the rest of the handout. So Kelly, I don't, oh, go ahead, Dale. Were you going to say something? Yeah, there's a question from uh, Shani. Um, for something like a Go Talk, how would you transition from PEX to the voice output? So I should have my Go Talk in front of me now, but of course I don't. So I'm going to put on the document camera a quick talker. And one of the things what we'll do is print out a double overlay. One overlay goes inside the device. The other overlay gets cut apart into individual cards. So now if I, I kind of mock it up here. So now on my quick talker, if you want to pin the document camera to see it. So then the symbols would be sitting on top. So I have a Velcro spot on top of them. And I tend to use the little plastic overlay covers to put Velcro on so that, well, it doesn't jam the paper um, in and out. And then I take the sentence strip and we attach it to the device. So we Velcro the sentence strip to the device and now they're going through the same process. They might grab their I want, bubbles, and as they're grabbing this symbol, they activate the device simply by the pushing and pulling from the Velcro. So they hear that message, they cre create their sentence strip like they would have done prior to it in their picture exchange book, and then they're able to pass it. Now, because the simple voice output devices only have one message at a time or a phrase or um, a paragraph, you're not going to hear this whole message. But they would, but you and your feedback could say, you know, I want bubbles. And you could give them the feedback from their device. So that's one of the ways we do it. Sorry, I don't have a live example for you. I go back in my closet and get, I've got two GoTalks set up this way. How's that help, Shani? Is that a, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. All right, very good. Yeah, it's one of our favorite things to do. <laughs> it's an easy fix in many situations. So on the, well, I told you things are going to start falling. The last slide that we had on the handout lists a variety of organizational strategies for AAC systems. And this comes out of the work of Dr. Sarah Blackstone and Gail Porter. And I kind of mash it together to make some sense of out of it. So we're going to take a look at these different organizer strategies. One of them is called schematic. And so when we look at schematic, what we tend to have in schematic devices are activity boards. So sometimes these are flip books. Sometimes these are the rings. They're also schematic overlays are associated with uh, choice boards and with picture exchange where I might have all of my toys together all of my food together. So I have those kinds of things grouped by a category and then I bring them into an activity. So I might be at snack time and I bring out things that are related to that activity. So you'll see this in different arrangements. I'm gonna try and go in the order of the slides. 
Um, also associated with low tech systems. So when I have things like the Go Talk, or I have things like the Quick Talker, or I have a communication book, you know, I might turn to the page. That's my snack vocabulary. Um, there's some pictures of this up on the um, device. Here is a whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> when you don't have enough desk space and products activate your, uh, get back there. This little device that's up on the, mama's there. Let's get back to topics. All right, so an act, another example of a low tech activity board are some of these, you know, toys that have built in communication. This is Lucas the lion loves the tiny talker. And so it's a story about Lucas who struggles with his roar. And then he has, you have different messages. So you have some basic messages that Lucas says as a part of the story. And um, it gives kids some practice. This little device actually comes off of the book too. You can disconnect it and kids can walk around with it. And it's just one of those little entry points, but very much based upon this reading activity. We have systems that are organized by topics. Many people know topics board associated with choice boards. So I might have all of my music. I might have all of my snacks. I might have a feelings board. The struggle with choice boards is that's all they are. You make a choice and then you're done with it. You know, you don't always have a way to go between these different choices. So, you know, these are things that are sometimes a classroom strategy or a beginning strategy, but should it be considered a child's robust system? Um, currently, there's some nice examples of topic boards that are based upon medical issues and health. So you'll find that USAC, the United States Society for AAC, they've got this medical board that's pictured at the top on the slide. Um, I don't have this one printed out. Um, and you'll see other companies have some medically related boards. Um, Boardmaker makes some free ones available through their Boardmaker share. You can find them on Pinterest um, so that you've got immediacy of needs. For any of you that work in medical situations, these kinds of things are being recommended to be in critical care units and other places where people might have a temporary loss of voice. Um, so that they have a way to spell out or to have pain management. My, um, my sister-in-law on the back of her communication board, so her communication board was based upon alphabet and spelling, but on the back of her board, she had, you know, messages that were immediate in nature. So things like I'm in pain or she needed hydration or a nebulizer or a tube feeding. So she and people who were, you know, involved with her in medical situations, she could tell somebody, you know, go call Judy. So that, so that rather than having to spell things out, when you're in pain, um, you're just able to point to a whole message or a part message. Um, and then these kinds of things combined with images of the body, you know, you could say I'm in pain and then point to the body part. So you kind of com combine what you're using. So again, but very um, topical related. We have other systems that are organized by categories. You've seen a couple already. Um, wristlets are getting very popular. Uh, Boardmaker had made a snap bracelet. Sometimes wristlets are just about getting some assistance like I, Linda Burkhart makes the, gets these made. Um, I've got something to say, please get my book. So if a child kind of shakes their hand and calls out, then you know to go get their communication book for them. But some of the wristlets get more involved. You know, it might be it, images that they need 
my upside down and backwards, um, to say things that are, you know, get somebody's attention. You'll see the um, augmentative resources company makes what we, I call them the football quarterback bracelets. So on the slide in the upper right hand corner is a cuff that's worn on a sleeve that has multiple overlays. So that somebody can run around outside and you know, to make have a portable system. And then the attainment company and AbleNet also have wrist talkers. So little, you know, two to four message devices that can be worn as a watch. And then you can have some quick social messages or whatever messages that you want um, on those kinds of things. And then let's get into kind of the more involved low tech systems. So I'm going to run by on the document camera things that fit into this category where you have a core vocabulary and then you have fringe. For a long time, the Mayor Johnson company, Toby Dynavox, has made this flip and talk. And flip and talk simply was choosing core vocabulary, however large that needed to be for your particular person, and then having a tabbed categorical flip book at the top. And you'll see that there are other companies that have picked up this style. So there's that. And they, if you're a board maker user, there is a flip and talk. Oh, you say, make sure you say that right. Um, a flip and talk template. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, on board maker so that you can make your own. At Lesson Picks, if you're a Lesson Picks person, they have several different styles of core vocabulary and then layouts with either one strip, two or four. You can with their templates make core plus fringe of whatever size you need. And then they have some that are pre-done so that you can, if you've never made one of these kinds of fringe vocabulary books before or flip books, it'll give you a nice example with it. They um, just recently published one that goes along with the Retopia reading series. And if you go to Lesson Picks and type in Retopia, you'll see all of that for free. Um, and so they're doing that in connections with the Don Johnston company. Some communication books are put together linguistically. So we look at pods, probably the one that's most familiar in that structure, where it's there are categories in here, there are activities in here, there's personal vocabulary, but it's based upon how kids communicate. So that, you know, many of our kids don't know categories. So to use a categorical structure is a barrier. You know, many of our kids are just learning what are emotion words and what are clothing words and what are people words? But what do you do before that? So you have to have some entry into communicating. Um, and so with pod, it talks about having chat. So we look at systems that have chat words. And then if you don't have a chat word to say in pod, you're gonna follow, let me get this closer you follow the numbers. So even though it's a book that has tabs at the bottom, it's a different style of tab. The tab's there for the communication partner, not for the communicator. So now if I have more to say than these words, I'm gonna to go to a page of what they refer to as pragmatic branches. And so now it's about what do I want to say? I like it. I don't like it. Something's wrong. I want to do something. I want to go somewhere. So if I want to go somewhere, you'll see there's a color and a number associated with that. And somebody turns, my smart partner turns the page for me, especially if I'm a beginning communicator. You want them fooling around with flipping pages. So now I'm at this message and I can say, oh, 
I want to go outside. And that might lead me to outside vocabulary. One of the things that I've especially appreciated about starting children with pod is that they transition onto the electronic systems very easily because they're used to pages being associated together. So if I say, I wanna go visit, visit is going to take me to people. And so there are these kind of natural linguistic links that happen. And we certainly could talk about pod all day. We do a two day class on pod, uh, but just recognize that that's one of the layouts. And then other things that are laid out linguistically, this will give you some nice examples of what the companies have available. You know, Proloqua to go with their crescendo vocabulary has um, overlays that you can print out for free from their website, Supercore. So again, all of these are structured so that I'm putting my messages together. Usually you see good use of color coding, personal pronouns, question words, verbs. Not everybody, I wish everybody would follow the same color coding strategies, but they don't. Um, for those of you that are LAMP Words for Life users, you know, they've got printouts. And Deanna, who's going to be with you in March, is the queen of low-tech LAMP. She has flip books that are created for her students that take and put all of the different links together. So hopefully she'll be sharing some of that information with you too. And then of course we can't ignore the alphabet. That having access to the alphabet gives um, your student the ability to say anything and unique. And you see lots of different layouts of alphabets, whether they're alphabetical order that highlight the vowels, I'm a teacher, so I tend to like those layouts and try those out with my kids because I want them to start recognizing that we put a vowel in every word. Sometimes you just can't help yourself from your background. Um, other people just will have alphabetical order in whichever, you know, however that's set up for them. And you'll see, like, here's an alphabet display from Supercore. <coughs> from Texas Region 4, they have a core vocabulary plus flip. And then you go to the alphabet on the back. How convenient is that? I mean, that's just terrific because it's right there. And I can use it for lessons and I can use it to say, oh, we have a new kid in class. What does her name start with? You know, and do some nice modeling that way. So this is, I'll put it up here from region four. I don't make any money from showing, them, showing you this to them. But they have, this is their core board that's also in, available in Spanish and a really large one that you can put on your wall. All right. Lastly here, I want to um, show you some of these things that get progressive. Um, and don't forget about kids telling stories. You know, sometimes we use low tech systems like Big Macs and Step Talkers so they can say, I have something to tell you. I watched a new TV program last night and it gets people engaged in a conversation with them. So, and they can tell that same story or joke. People do a lot of these with jokes over and over again. I know you've been introduced to Project Core. If you've never printed any of the things out there, they do have a series of four location boards so that you get your core vocabulary in that way or that same vocabulary is presented so that you can do partner assisted scanning. So we think about access methods, you know, or you can cut them apart and have them presented. I, these are just in those little baseball card holders, um, put them into an eye gaze frame. So they've got different arrangements of their core four you know, and then building up into high contrast, number of symbols. So make sure that you check out um, the things that are already made for you and freely available. Some things that are not always freely available, but are just are helpful are things that you can find on Teacher Pay Teacher. 
So Teacher Pay Teacher has a group of um, educators this or speech language pathologists. This is from Rebecca Price and Sarah Wainwright. So they have, you know, that strategy of you can build up to. So if I start with a masked out display where things are going to end up, and then as I introduce more vocabulary, those things stay in the same location and I just keep adding vocabulary till I get to the full design. And you'll see that masking feature built into different high-tech products, but we can do that with low-tech as well. All right, guys, have we raced through this fast enough for you all? That's the end of things that I'm gonna put on the document camera. Just the last couple of um, information pieces for you is we try to think about how we can rate enhance somebody and by using color coding, by using kind of masking, by using other devices to help them point. These are ways that add to the amount of messages and the pacing. And don't forget about repair strategies. How do kids repair communication? You've had presentations here at Project Echo about the competencies. So when we think about linguistic competency and strategic competency, operational competency um, and social competency, when we look in that operational and strategic repair strategies fit into both of those competencies. Um, in pod communication books, we have the oops built into every page. And in other systems, you'll also see things like, that's not what I meant. So that you can clarify messages during the process and afterwards. So things to put on your checklist um, for sure is how does my child repair communication? And they'll only learn to repair communication if you're modeling it from the beginning. Um, other features, things, how are they going to get it about? What's your carry strap look like? What's your carry bag look like? What color is it? Like I have kids that won't use stuff unless it's purple. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, they need to have a purple book, a purple bag and a purple switch. Um, and then they're all over it. All right, I'm going to check to see on questions. And then we're going to go through some action items and on to the case study. You're given great information, so much to think about, so many good uh, resources. And I love that you come back to, I know you're not promoting a particular product, but so many of us stay away from uh, the vendor stuff because we feel like they're going to try and sell us something. Um, but what they have is people who are, uh, are SLPs, who are working in the field of putting things together. So uh, bringing in these resources, um, it's it, it just going to make everybody's job. Um, it is. You know, the the wealth of information that's come out in the last year since many of us went into non-face-to-face -face school lockdown March 13th. I feel like we're coming up on this huge anniversary. Uh, many of us, like this is our sole way that we've been communicating. Um, that so many of the companies have jumped in and given access to and made, had people in their company make these free materials. With the new release of Boardmaker that just happened a month ago, so much is built into that that used to be other kinds of products. So activity-based boards with the activity that they go along with, um, more templates, those types of things. So. You know, I've tried to show you the things that are commercially available, but all of this stuff that you can make through if you've got um, symbol sticks through N2Y, if you have lesson picks, if you have board maker, and there are, you know, a host of other um, products as well that you can make displays with. The important part is the structure. Why are you making it? You're not just slamming pictures on a piece of paper willy nilly. 
Um, but you're really thinking about a child's structure. And that's why I like to go to the stuff that somebody other than I thought about it. <laughs> yeah, and Kelly, thank you so much for that. And, uh, you know, I, I, in the supports and the professional development that we're putting together, I don't yet have a feel for the tools that people are using to create their visual supports and their low tech. So if anybody, uh, you know, we've talked about board maker and symbol sticks and all, uh, as we move forward into the case study, if people would just type into the chat box what the go-to tool is, um, whether you use lesson picks, whether you go on and find free symbols, uh, if you just give us a clue, because I'd, I'd sure like to know. Excellent. Maker seven. So we don't have to hold still for this, but it, okay. As you're thinking uh, about it, folks, what is it that you're using? If you don't have access to something, um, then certainly that's something that I, we'd like to talk about. How can we make it available if you don't? But whatever you're using, you just want to clip. Thanks for humoring me. All right. So as you think about your system, whether it's low tech or high tech, think about this structure from Maureen, that what's the package? What's the format of it? What's going to be my software, my app, or like my organizational structure? What's the third part, the page set, the symbols, all of those pieces? And then what are the peripherals that you need? You know, whether you need something, access method, mounting systems, um, it becomes a nice way to structure your features. What features do I need for part one, part two, part three, and part four? Some of the companies for the high-tech systems help you put those things together. But of course, that's a, a subject for another time. I always am promoting using um, Joy Zabala's feature match matrix as we're thinking about even low-tech systems. What about the features that we've talked about over the last 30 minutes are a good match for your students? And what are the possible technologies that you want to trial? so that you can go through and just figure out, yes, it has it, no, it doesn't. And it will give you a good place to start. And then um, from my buddy, Pat Durand in, uh, Durand in um, Baltimore, she reminds us that we always need to be thinking ahead, that it's not just for the now, but for where a child's growth is happening language-wise. And that we don't want to make sure, we want to make sure that whatever system we're um, using with our students doesn't limit the number of people that they can talk to or who they can talk to. So we want to promote that interaction piece. Also, the companies give you great supports. Um, on CoughDrop, you'll see some assessment resources for layout and symbols. Um, Toby Dynavox has the DAG with all of the forms based upon language and where a child is in their development of use of AAC. And Pranky um, Satillo have their AAC profile. That's a good checklist to leading you to some of the higher tech devices and the language lab with Jane Odom's wonderful activities. And then I just kind of I didn't expect to do a presentation on these, just always giving you a list of AAC assessment tools, reminders of the things that you might already know, and that this fits in low tech too, not just in high tech. So the last couple pages here are just resources. I'm going to be um, just going quickly uh, through a case study of one of my students, Creedy. Um, and Creedy is, uh, well, now she's 10, just had her birthday two weeks ago, um, that she has Rett syndrome and she uses her eyes to access now. So what we want to do is um, take you through kind of her progression from low tech to transitioning to high tech, but continuing to use low tech. So is this a good time for that, Deb, or? I think it is. All right. So on this slide, I kind of gave you the rundown. You've got the Facebook page, um, and I'm gonna switch over to some um, slides just to narrate Creedy's story.
So as I mentioned, Creedy is, when I met her, she wa is, was eight years old. Um, her, when I met her, her communication system was set up as an eye gaze frame with four locations. And because of some of, you know, we have some kids that have Rett syndrome that have cortical vision impairment, or they, you know, they get locked in visually to certain symbols. One of the things that they had been trying was this, to slowly expose the symbols that were on the display. And these four symbols would change, right? They would cover them up. You know, it would be another set of four, you know, and then she would look to, or sometimes she might slap uh, up to where that symbol was, but there wasn't a structure as to which symbols were together, were things always in the same place. They really were mostly looking at access and not really communication and building language. So after um, her, her mom and speech language pathologist came to a pod training, and so this is what she's at now. One of the things that she started using was that pod 12 that I had that's now on my floor. Um, so she went to 12 locations that people would do partner assisted scanning with. So if I grab it off my floor. Things disappear. I don't know. So she um, and then she went to a 20 book and this is the book that she is using now. And so they would look at it as your symbol on this half. So still using eye gaze, they went to, is it, I can't hold it up. Is it on this half or is it on this half? And then if she would look at this half of the page, then you would say this column, this column. And if she nodded, yes, or she actually turns her head um, away from you and looks at you or towards you for her yes or sometimes her whole body. She has a couple different movements for yes and we need to be flexible with that's the one I want when we're doing things like partner assisted scanning with kids. Um, and then you would go down the symbols and then when you were pointing to the one that she wanted to say, she, you know, or it's, and someday she's very vocal and so she might vocalize <coughs> as well. She's currently shifting to a color-coded eye gaze system where she looks to the half of the page and then she looks at the color at the top of the column. So what we're trying to do in adding um, some more access to it is to make it faster for her so that she doesn't have to wait for somebody to say, is it this column, this column, this column, this column, this column. Like it's forever for some partner assisted scanners. So we use the power that she has in eye gaze, half versus half, and then looking at associating the color with the row. Um, if you're interested in seeing some video, I don't have video of her doing this access method yet because we're just, getting this going there. If you look um, on YouTube for Anna, A-N-N-A -N -N -A, and pod. So Anna and pod, you'll find a nice video of somebody showing you what color coded access looks like. So th this will give you an example of Creedy using her, um, her system electronically. Let me share the sound. So, you know, layouts, a lot of times when I'm working, so I'm looking right at them with Creedy and I'm going to show you a picture of her desk area so you see how everything is. So she's got her printed book there in front of her and then her mom is telling me what she's looking at. And you, you'll be able to see how clear she can be with her yeses. If she didn't come out of the box with a yes, that's something that's been taught over time. And you know what, Preeti? Oops, mom doesn't have that. But I can go get number eight. We are already making it. One second, Preeti. Wow. Have a seat. 
you're asking a question. Questions are really good words, Creedy. So things like, ask me a yes or no. Are you gonna give me a wave and a high five? Are you gonna pick up my book? <laughs> Sometimes she will do that. If I hold the book up or I've got there it. You go. I'm we centered on the question. document How camera question page. All right. So sometimes if I have hold the book up or I've got it centered on the document camera, she'll point um, or she'll respond to me doing partner assisted scanning um, through the document camera. The funny thing about this video is that we were in the process of moving from the 12 symbol book to the 20 and her mom was printing it out one page at a time. So I, we would be worried. She's like, oh, I have to go get page eight. <laughs> and it was still printing throughout our time together. But that's that's kind of how we got started um, when I started working with her. And then she had had access to an eye gaze system, but it was the accuracy of it for her expressive communication wasn't on board right away. So they did things like games. They did Tar Heel gameplay so some of her favorite videos then have spots on the screen that she looks at so she did a lot of practice with that before we started even thinking that she would expressively communicate um, with her eye gaze system but just because you're learning your access method doesn't mean you don't get to talk and that's one of the reasons that we use low tech is that we have a means of communicating while we're building skills, especially around access to high tech. Um, they have a Facebook page called KM Communication Wins. And I think I've got that link on the handout if you wanna see all kind of her path to it. So some days this is our, our layout here on the left where um, you know, I'm, talking to her from her screen, and then they log in a second time and go right from their computer, or her mom logs in from her phone and then puts the phone off to the side so I can see another angle. So that's been very helpful. But a lot of times, you know, as she's learning to use her electronic system, she's doing some repeats, but she it can be very meaningful. So like want, 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 where is, that's a phrase together, mom. So, you know, then you're starting to interpret and put things um, and model back in another way. We've had our struggles technology wise, just like everybody else, um, where we're locked, where they'll log in right from her AAC system so I can see where she's looking. Um, we went through <clears throat> some issues of pulling that she was always pulling up the panel. So we had to figure out how to put that on sleep. And then whoops, what I'll see, it's kind of is this little ring. So if you can see this little faded circle here, I can see that from my screen when she's sharing to me or when we do shared screen. So I can start to comment on what she's getting close to or what she's looking at. So those that's been very helpful uh, because we are thousands of miles away between us. I mean, she's not a student that I once saw in person and am now virtual and then I'm gonna be back in person with. This is my full-time virtual student. Um, this is because people are always curious about setup. So when she has her, communi her printed communication book and then she has her monitor that she's logged in with, and then they have all the other kinds of instructional things at home. She's a full-time at-home student now. So she's not a hybrid or and she's receiving all of her, her services that way. They moved, <laughs> and this gets kind of crazy. They moved the station as more technology got involved. And so this is her eye gaze system. So here's her Toby eye gaze, her eye series device, her printed book. 
And then she has the monitor that she looks at her teachers or whoever's, you know, working with her. And then she has another monitor for instructional materials. And we, this has been built up over time, you know, and, and if you tell people that she's got a cortical vision impairment, people like get whacked out, um, but she does. <laughs> But what we have found is the consistency of where she goes to look at you, where she goes to look to talk, where she goes to look at her English language arts or her math materials, it worked out much better for her that those be in solid places, kind of that dependable, predictable motor plan places, because that also works for her with her Rett syndrome as well rather than using one screen and switching it between AAC person, instruction, AAC person, instruction. And that was just too much for her visual um, presence. So just to give you guys some images, I'm hoping, I'm, um, I don't have permission to share this as a handout. Um, I have permission to show this to you but I'm hoping to be able to get that permission. Plus, if you go to their uh, Facebook page, you'll see all of this and more. So this is like a crazy school day. You know, so again, electronic, printed, where she sees her teacher, where she sees her instructional materials, her mom's work <laughs> on the side. And then her mother said the best thing that they got was this rolling cart that has all the different kinds of instructional materials that they need for the math teacher, reading teacher, their groups that they're in. And I know that we are quickly out of time here. Um, so just a, a little bit of what we've been doing is that she's been buddied up. Uh, so I, I did a all call out to some of my colleagues and some of you know Jane Corston here, this is her granddaughter, Millie. Millie and Creedy have never met physically in person, but now they are, well, they, for a while, they were two nine-year-olds together. Now one's nine and one's 10, and they share a relationship through literacy. We did writing activities with them. You can see some examples of those in some of my writing um, webinars that I've done, where they've shared what they've written. And even in times when they can't be virtually together, they share emails with each other of one reading a book. They do shared reading. They do shared writing. I don't even meet with them anymore. I mean, I got them started for the first like six weeks in March and April. Now they meet on their own schedule. So sometimes it's on the weekends and it's been a really, it's been really fun to follow them and be a little looky-loo into their uh, buddy relationship. So that's, you know, my best advice is get kids connected if you're still virtual and, you know, in person and, you know, don't let low tech be something that becomes a barrier. It, we are very interactive with low tech. It doesn't just happen through high tech. Creedy fluidly moves between printed and electronic. Sometimes she will start a message on her printed system and finish it on her electronic system. Not unlike kids that use their voice and sign language together or their voice and their symbols. So she's definitely a multi-modal communicator. So like I said, we got started with writing and this is now what her school day is like. She's doing virtual school through the Kata Hearn Academy. This was the summer program. I didn't link on and get the winter. Um, but she has probably three or four of these different classes with the group. And then she has individual classes with individual teachers in these areas. So she has quite a busy <coughs> virtual school life day. And all of us are working on communication at the same time. In fact, I just met with the, one of the new reading teachers last night and getting that reading teacher up and going with Creedy's communication. All right, Miss Deb. Fascinating application. I'm just taking us through and, and a, a plot. that's why we do case studies. 
is because it's not just an abstract. Now we're bringing it down to a face and, and what that looks like. And so I imagine that some of you, as she was going through, you were saying, yes, that's something I might have tried. And some of you, uh, maybe that's something that, that those um, strategies may have never entered your mind. Well, regardless of where you come to, uh, to meet with us, um, we all grow together. I learned things today. Uh, I'm not uh, SLP. Um, I have been in the boat with a lot of SLPs and moving forward with uh, communication as an assistive tech person, but I don't go away from any of these sessions without learning something that could be life altering for a student. So uh, we are out of time for today, but I wanna thank Kelly uh, so much for sharing these low tech strategies. Uh, so many times people get an idea that they have to be using pull a quote ago. And you know, those are some of the, what I might call tool, tool du jour. Um, that, okay, this is what you are using and, and you, you somehow are trying to find a way to make this fit for everybody, it just doesn't. So having some low tech options, having experts like uh, uh, Kelly come and share um, strategies, having you st share strategies, it's through partnership that we find better ways. I'm thrilled to say that Kelly will be with us for our virtual conference coming up in April. Uh, we are finalizing her topics. Uh, but we, she mentioned Jane Corston. Jane will be here. We are so excited about what we're putting together. It's a big task, but it's a, it's a puzzle that we are, are enjoying and bringing together what you need. So continue to let us know what it is that you need. And uh, we look forward to seeing you when Deanna comes to us in March. Uh, but until then, please feel free to uh, share with us the struggles that you might have because when we talk about them, we find that you're not the only one. Sometimes you may feel like that, but you're not. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Gail. Thanks to all of you for doing the jobs that you do every day. Your resilience through the last year has been uh, amazing. You are inspirational to all of us. So keep doing that and keep coming back on Wednesdays uh, to echo with us. Take care, everybody. And Kelly and Gail, stay on. We'll have a bit of a chat here. Good to see all of you. <laughs> I mess at the side. This is what my floor looks like now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a constant exercise in organization.